Okay, um, so we're going to start on uh, the New Testament survey. Uh, before we begin, can somebody open us in prayer, please? Can I pray, sister? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that you have given us to learn on your word, my master. I pray that you will transform us through this word in our spirit and in our soul and body, my master. That everyone who is joined together to learn your word will align to your teaching, my master. Yes. And I also pray for our sister that you will inspire to give us the right word, my master, today. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so we'll um, again do a review of what we covered in the last class and then continue from there. So um, we were looking at um, the intertestamental period, right? I think, uh, did we cover this in the last class? I think we did. The uh, We ended with the people groups, right? So the last two groups of people were the publicans and the zealots, right? We did that in the last class. OK. So um, these were the two people groups. Uh, that are mentioned in the New Testament, uh, the publicans being uh, tax collectors who were employed by the Roman government. Uh, so the Romans had taken over from the Maccabees. The Maccabees were Jews who had been reigning over the uh, the Palestine region. And then the Romans came in and uh, they uh, they uh, established their control over Jerusalem and over that region. Uh, and then they had people who were reporting to them. So they had tax collectors who would collect taxes from the Jews and pay it to the Roman government. So the tax collectors were not um, were not favored among the Jewish people. Um, and then there were the zealots who were on the other side who were completely against the Roman government. Um, and uh, these were people who would re later revolt against the Roman rule uh, in AD 66. Uh, they revolted against the Roman rule, uh, but the Romans um, reestablished their control over that region. and. Uh, at this time, in AD 70, is when the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, so during Jesus' ministry is when the Romans are in power. And post that, in AD 70, is where the Jerusalem temple is uh, destroyed. Um, so we looked at the Jewish synagogue that was established uh, during uh, the time of the Persian rule, right? When the uh, Persian, when the Israelites went into captivity under the Babylonians, they started to emphasize the teaching of the law and the passing of Hebrew scriptures, helping people know their scriptures, know their identity as Jews. Uh, and then when they came back under the Persian rule, they returned to um, to Jerusalem and to other parts of the Palestine region and started to live there. Uh, synagogues were set up for people to continue learning the Torah. And uh, this is how scribes came to start leading in the synagogues and to pass on the teachings of the Torah to help people know the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, so why are the synagogues important? Because this is where Jesus, as he was traveling, would go and uh, preach to people. And this is where the disciples 
post Jesus resurrection, they went and shared about Jesus in the synagogues. So the synagogues became key places for the spreading of the gospel. And became uh, they also became kind of a model for how the church started to function after um, after Jesus's resurrection. So after the church was established. Um, so some of the sacred writings we looked at, uh, we looked at the Hebrew Bible, uh, right? So uh, the Hebrew Bible is the same as our Old Testament scriptures, but there's a difference in the number of books because they have certain books uh, that are clubbed together. So we'll just look at that. Yeah, some of their books are clubbed together like the minor prophets we have individual books for all the minor prophets but they have it all in a single book um, they also have kings as a single book samuel as a single book whereas we have samuel one and two kings one and two um, so the content is the same just uh, the number of books is different and the arrangement of the books uh, we have our books arranged in a slightly different order than the hebrew scriptures Um, another important sacred writing is the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, but the Septuagint also has uh, some additional uh, books that are not included in the Hebrew canon. Um, so the Septuagint, why it is important is because it was translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. And it made the Hebrew scriptures available to all of the uh, all of the Jews who were not familiar with Hebrew anymore, under the Greek rule, they had all started speaking Greek, and so Hebrew was not as familiar to them. So to have the scriptures in their uh, the language that was popular at the time, and then in the New Testament, most uh, of the Old Testament quotations are actually from this Greek translation rather than the original Hebrew um, version of the Old Testament, a lot of the Old Testament quotations come from the Greek version. Um, we started looking at the gospel. So uh, gospel means good news. And so um, the Jesus, the coming of Jesus was viewed as good news because it's a fulfillment of the Old Testament uh hopes of the people of israel for a deliverer for a messiah to come and uh, save the people of israel from uh, bondage under different rulers who had ruled over them for so many hundreds of years um we have we looked a little bit at the genre of the gospels so uh, they are historical uh, in that they are reliable records of what has been written, uh, what actually took place. Their narrative, because they tell a story. It's not an imaginary story, but it's uh, based on history. And it uses people and places and different settings to communicate what happened um, in Jesus's time. Um, they are the theological. Each of them has an uh, important message that they want to communicate to the people uh, of that time, their audience, right? There was a specific message they wanted to communicate. So uh, there is theology in the Gospels. And um, they are biographies in that they tell about the life of Jesus, but they're not just biographies. So uh, when you look at ancient biographies, um, they were always written uh, to kind of make the the person that they're writing about like a very, very, like a superhero with no imperfections. So it would be very, uh, they would take away any stories that would highlight the weakness of the person or highlight anything that the person did that wouldn't be viewed as acceptable in that time. Uh, but we see here in the Gospels that they were very real. They uh, talked about the weaknesses of the disciples. They talked about the crucifixion of Jesus. They didn't try to make everything, they didn't try to make Jesus seem all-powerful uh, in that 
he never experienced any suffering. He never experienced any times of weakness. So we read about uh, Jesus crying, uh, crying out and praying for the cup uh, of suffering to be taken from him. So they also talk about the weaknesses, the sufferings, the weaknesses of the disciples, their shortcomings. Uh, so they are not uh, they're not just highlighting all of the uh, the good things that happened. They're talking very realistically about what happened. Um, so yeah, the, finally we concluded the Gospels are historical uh, narrative motivated by theological concerns. And uh, through this, they talk about the good news of Jesus Christ calling people to believe in him. <clears throat> so um, we'll now go into uh, just an introduction to the Synoptic Gospels. So uh, the Synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, and why they are called the Synoptic Gospels is because uh, a lot of the content in these three books is actually uh, very similar. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between these three books. Um, so we see over 90% of Mark is found in Matthew and Luke. Uh, especially Matthew uses a lot of the same content. So some people think that they all use the same uh, source document. Some people think that Matthew and Luke just used Mark as a uh, basis for then writing their own books. Okay, so that's why there's so much of an overlap between uh, these three books. So synoptic, um, why we use that word is because um, sin means the first part of that word, S-Y-N means common and optic means view. So these three gospels give us a common view of uh, who Jesus was, what he was doing. Um, and there's quite a vast array of things that they talk about Jesus, right? They talk about what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was doing, about his life, all of those things. Um, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of have the same stories that they all talk about, whereas John is quite different from these three Gospels. Um, so why do we have four Gospel accounts? Uh, any thoughts on that? Why do we have four Gospel accounts? Is it necessary or could we just have had Mark and that would have been enough? Ma'am, yes. All the four uh, viewed at different angles on uh, different angles uh, on Jesus Christ. Their views in different uh, angles. Yeah. So each of them uh, present Jesus from a different perspective or a different light, right? Uh, why did they do that? Because each of them experienced Jesus' ministry in different ways. Each of them was writing to a different audience. Um, and so their goals as writers were different from each other. Uh, so we see here, uh, Matthew talks about Jesus as the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. So uh, we'll see a lot in Matthew about how Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. Jesus um, did this, Jesus said this, or uh, this is what happened, and this was a fulfillment of this Old Testament scripture. Matthew will uh, do a lot of that. So he's talking about how Jesus fulfilled all of these Old Testament prophecies. So uh, his highlight is Jesus as the Messiah to the Jews, the uh, Messiah that they had been waiting for, uh, the deliverer that they had been waiting for. Um, Mark uh, looks, uh, focuses more on Jesus as the one who suffered, who offered himself as a sacrifice, so the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, that was his focus on the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. Uh, Luke, uh, uh, his focus is more on the Gentiles, on uh, Jesus as the savior for the whole world. Whereas Matthew is focusing on the Jews, he also does definitely address Gentiles. Uh, but his, uh, his general message is to the Jews. Um, Luke, on the other hand, is the savior for all nations, uh, the savior for all people. 
so uh, that is the difference in perspective and john uh, talks about jesus as uh, that eternal word who became flesh right so uh, the one who was before all creation coming down and becoming one of us uh, and then him revealing the father to us so um, each of them just brings that difference in perspective uh, and they also um, help us to get a full a more full picture of who jesus is giving us all of these different angles uh, for him and uh, what he did on this earth um, so there have been attempts to reduce these four gospels to a single gospel so there were people who tried to put all the gospel accounts together and make a single book um, but what happens is that we lose out on each of those messages uh, each of them tells the same story in different ways how do you uh, put all of those differences into one single story all of those things became a challenge and so the church realized that because each book was so unique it was important to keep each book as it was um in your textbook we won't go through this in class because there's a comparison between all the four gospels and everything that is talked about in each gospel which book it comes in so say for example the birth of jesus which all gospels is the birth of jesus talked about in or uh, if uh, it talks about simeon at the temple uh, who which all gospels actually mention simeon at the temple so each story is listed there and it's a few pages long so pages 15 to 23 in your textbook cover that comparison between the four gospels we won't go over it in class but if you are interested in just looking at what stories were there what stories were excluded in each of the gospels it's all available in your textbook so the other question is why are there only four gospel accounts and we talked about this a little bit in class last week um, there are other gospels that have been found uh, other manuscripts that have been found ancient manuscripts why were those not included as part of the gospels uh, so two examples that we have in our textbook is the gospel of thomas and the gospel of peter um, there is another gospel called the gospel of james uh, these are all known as infancy gospels so they talk a lot about uh, jesus in as a child and jesus's early years which these uh, matthew mark luke john don't talk about um, so they talk a lot about that but uh, there are some challenges with these gospels uh, so we look at what were the reasons some gospels were kept in the scriptures in the new testament scriptures and why were some gospels rejected um, part of it is historical reliability so how do we know that what was written was reliable one is when was it written uh, if something is closer to the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, it's considered as more reliable because there were still eyewitnesses alive uh, who could challenge what was being written, who could question if something was written that was untrue, they could uh, address that. And also, the closer it's written to an event, we can trust that people have remembered what actually happened and have written um have documented it correctly right so 20 years later if people are still talking about it and recording it it's more likely that they've recorded the correct events than 100 years later right so we look at how close was it to the life and ministry of jesus um, the other thing is who wrote it was it written by someone who was an eyewitness or someone who was close to the uh, the eyewitnesses was able to get accounts of eyewitnesses um so we see uh, some of these gospels uh, the, like the gospel of uh, thomas gospel of peter gospel of james um the gospel of thomas i think and i'll go back and uh, just recheck that uh, is where 
uh, it's actually believed that was not written by the apostle. It was written by somebody else, but they claim, uh, not sorry, not the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter was not actually written by Peter. It was written by somebody else who claimed to be Peter. So that is another thing. Who actually wrote the book? Was it really one of the disciples or one of the eyewitnesses or someone who is close to the eyewitnesses who could get reliable accounts of Jesus's ministry? The other thing is, is it in agreement with other historical records that we have? Right. So when they're talking about Jesus as an infant uh, and they're talking about miracles that he did when he was a child, uh, are there other records of that? Do, do we know that other people were talking about this? If so, then it can be proved to be true. But if there are no other records and it's not from a reliable source, then we have to question whether it's actually something that can be trusted. So these were some of the questions that were asked of the uh, Gospels, especially. Uh, <clears throat> the other uh, criteria that was taken is, does it have spiritual uh, power and authority coming from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So is this truly inspired by the Holy Spirit? Does it carry uh, that spiritual power and authority? And then the third thing is orthodoxy. So uh, this was a big thing that uh, was important to the church. They were trying to preserve the doctrine of the church, right? So whatever is being said has to be in line with uh, scriptural teaching. Um, there was a lot of heresies that were going around, a lot of wrong teaching. We see that right in uh, the letters of Paul and Peter where they are addressing wrong teaching that was going around in the church. Uh, so there were also books that were being written by these other groups of people, like, uh, for example, the Gnostics. So uh, the Gnostics were a group of people who claimed that there was special uh, spiritual revelation that they had received uh, that gave them knowledge about things that were outside of what is in this in the Bible. Um, so they had certain books that were written in the Gnostic Gospels. Um, there's a Gospel of Mary. There's a secret book of James. So there are different books like that that were written by Gnostics, which didn't get included in these Gospels and didn't get included in the New Testament books because their, uh, their teaching or their doctrine didn't agree with the church's doctrine. Uh, so to uh, protect right teaching within the church, there were certain books that were rejected. Uh, so these are some of the criteria that went into choosing which books came in, especially now we're looking at the Gospels, which were the four Gospels that were actually included and the Gospels that were excluded. OK, so um, we looking at, is there a single Gospel or are there different Gospels, right? So uh, there's a difference in how we use that word. If we uh, look at... Um, uh, look at the scriptures, Galatians 1 6. If someone can read that for us, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of christ thank you so um here we see that emphasis on there is a single gospel um it's there isn't there aren't multiple gospels there aren't uh, multiple uh, messages of salvation that can be accepted there's one single gospel and that gospel had to do with the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, that uh, so that in that was the salvation of all people. Um, so why we say Gospels is more in reference to those four books. It's not about the message, 
the message is a single message, which is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Uh, but the four gospels are four accounts of that good news. Um, so there are different ways in which the good news is described. Uh, it's called the gospel of grace to talk about um, we are saved by grace and not by works, right? So uh, to differentiate between the, the new covenant and the old covenant. Uh, so the gospel of grace, the gospel of Christ, is Jesus, the good news of Jesus being the salvation for all people. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom, which is uh, the good news of being invited to be part of God's kingdom. Uh, the gospel of salvation. Uh, and the gospel of peace, so the gospel of uh, the good news of salvation and the good news of peace uh, with God. So when uh, Jesus' birth is announced, they say good news to um, all people, uh, peace on earth, goodwill to men, right? So the coming of God's peace to people. So as being able to enter into the peace of God, into that shalom of God. Um, so those are different ways in which this same one gospel is described based on what the gospel writer is trying to focus on. Okay, uh, so with that, we've finished our introduction to the gospels. Uh, we look at the gospel according to Matthew. We now start to look at uh, the different books in the New Testament, uh, beginning with Matthew and then going into the rest of the New Testament. Uh, so we obviously don't have time to uh, go into full detail into each book. So we'll do kind of like an introduction or an overall picture of the book, understand its background, understand what was its main message, uh, and uh, some of the things that the writer was trying to communicate uh, or uh, what was being taught through that specific book in the New Testament. Um, <clears throat> so Matthew, the background, uh, we see in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was constantly pointing to somebody who would come as a deliverer for the people of Israel. And what the Old Testament said about that deliverer, about that Messiah, was that he would be from the line of David and that he would bring restoration to the people. So the people uh, had obviously fallen from that place of... Um, of divine uh, blessing that they had, right? They had entered into the promised land. They had uh, then been captured. They'd gone into exile. And throughout all of that, there is a promise of restoration uh, in the Old Testament. Then after the Old Testament and before the New Testament, uh, there is a renewed anticipation. So we talked about this in those 400 years from Malachi to Matthew, uh, that there were different rulers who came in who were uh, ruling over that region in which the people of Israel were living. And so in this time, there is more uh, an increased desire for somebody to come to save them from the oppression that they were facing under all of these different rulers. Uh, so they viewed the Messiah as someone who would deliver them from their oppressors, who would defeat their enemies, who would establish his throne in Jerusalem and from Jerusalem reign over the whole earth, uh, who would conquer the temple and who in doing all of that would they would see signs and wonders accompanying that person's uh, work there whatever they were coming to do to deliver the people but it was viewed very much as a political um, savior like someone who would save them politically and who would reign over them as uh, as a king as a physical ruler in jerusalem Uh, so obviously Jesus uh, didn't come in the way they expected, right? Uh, while they were waiting for someone who would uh, come and save them from the government, 
Jesus came in a very different way, uh, showing them uh, that the slavery they were experiencing, the oppression they were experiencing in the physical realm uh, was, uh, was just almost like a picture of what actually was happening spiritually, that they were actually uh, under, uh, they, they needed deliverance spiritually. And that's what Jesus came to uh, give as the Messiah. Uh, so <clears throat> in Matthew, Matthew is presenting that Jesus to us. Jesus as the fulfillment, but also Jesus as someone who uh, came in a way that they didn't expect, that the Jews didn't expect. Um, so some of the characteristics of the book of Matthew is that it's a uh, very concise in comparison to Mark. So if you look at the same story in Mark uh, and then the same story in Matthew, you'll see that Mark adds a lot more detail, a lot more description to the story, a lot more conversation, uh, whereas Matthew will just give you the main points. Uh, so it's a shortened version, just focusing on certain things that he thought was important. Um, it may be for this reason that uh, Matthew was used the most as uh, the early church was uh, raising up disciples as they were making records of the scriptures. Matthew was actually the most circulated book in the early church uh, and was also used for liturgy within the church. Um, yeah, so we see... Um, Matthew focusing on Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures and Old Testament prophecies. Um, we see also within Matthew a focus on the Jews, but also broadening that to the Gentiles. So uh, some of the ways we see the focus on the Jews is uh, he quotes a lot of things from the Jewish scriptures. So in Matthew 5.18, he talks about the jot or tittle, which is something very specific to uh, the Jewish uh, teaching on scriptures, that not even one, uh, one small thing should be changed in the scriptures. When the scribes were copying scriptures, they had to pay so their attention had to be so focused that not even one small a mistake could be made. No small change could be made in the scriptures. So that's what Matthew 5.18 talks about. Uh, Matthew 23.2 talks about the seat of Moses. So these were all things that were very familiar to the Jews. So if someone from an uh, outside the Jewish uh, faith would not know about these things. Uh, so that's why we see that Matthew was specifically talking to the Jews, presenting Jesus as the Messiah to the Jews. Uh, Matthew 15, 24 talks about the lost sheep of Israel. Um, and then even in the genealogy, the way Matthew writes the genealogy is in a rabbinic style. Uh, but while Matthew is focusing on the Jews, he doesn't forget the Gentiles. He uh, still does focus on the Gentiles because we'll, we'll look more at uh, why, what would be the purpose of talking to the Gentiles is because the church was comprised of both Jews and Gentiles, right? So when Matthew is writing, he's writing to a church that is mixed. Uh, between Jews and Gentiles. Uh, however, his audience is primarily Jewish. And so his focus is primarily on the Jews, but he will definitely include the Gentiles in his message. So he uh, talks about in Matthew 2, 2 about um, the wise men coming in. So the wise men were from, uh, the Magi were from a Gentile background, right? Uh, so he includes Gentiles in the birth narrative of Jesus. Um, he also talks about Jesus going to Egypt uh, as a child. So that's in Matthew 2.13, uh, talking about going to a Gentile land. And then Matthew 28.19, the commission for the gospel to be taken to all nations, right? Not only to the Jews, so taking it even to the Gentiles. Um, 
Matthew's focus also is much more on the church than we see in the other gospels. Uh, only Matthew uses this word ecclesia, in, uh, and we see that in Matthew 16, 18, and 18, 17. Um, so, uh, and then he talks about it a little more. Matthew 18, 20, he talks about uh, two or three gathered in the name of Christ. Matthew 28, 19, he talks about teaching and baptizing new disciples. So he is concerned about uh, the church. Uh, we see that focus in Matthew. Um, a lot of people have questioned whether, uh, if you see Matthew 16, 18, let's just open that up, Matthew 16, 18. Uh, yes, Gertrude, you have a question? Sorry. Sister, I have a question. Yes. Now, Jesus called his uh, disciples when he was 30 years old. So, yes. about the birth and his childhood and all those, uh, the disciples were not uh, present with him. So, how accurate is that, uh, all that uh, incidents that are written in the Bible? Yeah, so... Um, all of those things are because they interacted so closely with Jesus. They interacted uh, with Jesus's family. So they had access directly to Mary through Jesus, right? So uh, their accounts come from that firsthand interaction uh, with Jesus. So uh, with Jesus, with Mary, uh, those would be the sources for their uh, writing. Um, in terms of accuracy, they are the ones who could get closest to Jesus. Uh, for someone, anyone else, it would have been a secondhand thing where they were not interacting with the firsthand witnesses. Uh, so they were asking, for, uh, they were getting information from other people and then writing about it. Um, now, obviously, we don't know that they actually went to Mary and asked her questions, but we know that yeah. because of their interaction with Jesus, because they were um, uh, living and ministering with Jesus, they had access to uh, information firsthand. Okay, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Was there an, any other questions? Okay, um, so let's uh, just continue from there. We were looking at Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hate shall not prevail against it. Thank you. So uh, we see here that Jesus himself is using the word church right so uh, many people have questioned could jesus have actually used that word uh, because there was no church in existence at that time the church only came into existence after jesus's resurrection when the disciples started going out with the gospel is when they started to gather and worship god and then the church came into existence um but uh, we see in um in the Septuagint, that there was a Hebrew word kahal, which means congregation. So that was used to describe uh, Israel as a congregation, uh, gathering. And then we also see the practice of the synagogue, which was a gathering of the local believers uh, meeting in one place. So that concept of the church was definitely in existence. So ecclesia is a Greek word. Um, that comes from this Hebrew concept. Um, we also see this word Ecclesia being used in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, it was used to refer to God's community. Uh, and in Greek culture, it was used to talk about assemblies. So usually it would be if citizens were assembling in a city, uh, that Ecclesia was used. So it's not a word that was not at all used in culture or in 
uh, among the Jews before that. So it's very possible that Jesus himself used that word here. Um, and so when Matthew uses it, uh, we we can uh, see that already that practice or that idea of the gathering of believers was being created at this time. OK, so um, in Matthew, we also see a greater focus on the end times uh, as compared to the other Gospels. So we see in chapters 24 and 25 where there is an extended uh, teaching that Jesus gives on the end times. Uh, and then Matthew 13, 36, if we, we can just open to that and read that verse, Matthew 13, 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. OK, thank you. So uh, if we go on, uh, if you can read um, verse 39 onwards, please, brother. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of, his, of this age. The, uh, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing, gnashing of teeth, uh, um, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Thank you. So uh, we see here uh, a parable that is pointing to the end of the age, right? Um, so talking about uh, judgment, about the final destiny of every human being, uh, post-judgment, where will the soul of a person be? Uh, so talking about all of that, uh, we see Matthew focusing on it much more. Uh, we see also uh, in the parable of the 10 virgins in Matthew 25. We see the parable of the talents also in Matthew 25, uh, talking about those end times that uh, isn't as much in focus in the other Gospels. Um, so with that, we just come, uh, we come to the end of some of the, uh, sorry, the unique features of Matthew's gospel. Uh, we'll just quickly look at authorship and then we can close. Sorry, I'm just going to get a sip of water. Sister, can you just review us about this Ecclesia once again? Uh, just review that, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, um, so we see this word ecclesia being used. This is the first time it's used in the New Testament, uh, Matthew sixteen eighteen and Matthew eighteen seventeen. And in Matthew, um, we didn't actually read Matthew eighteen seventeen. Uh, let me just open that up. Of someone has it open, Matthew 18, 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he, if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be like you. Uh, so, sorry, let him be uh, to you like a heathen and a tax collector. OK. Thank you. So here in Matthew 18 is where it's more from a how does the uh, how do we respond to somebody who um, doesn't receive your witness, right? Uh, and this was also uh, something that was attributed to Jesus that Jesus said this. Uh, and Matthew 16, 18 as well, Jesus said it. So uh, the question is, how could Jesus have used the word ecclesia, used the word church, uh, when there was no church at this time? 
right? Uh, the church only came into existence after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, so we look at the word itself being used in that cultural context. Was it a word that was known? Was it being used? Uh, and if so, how was it being used? Um, so we see uh, we there is another uh, Greek word kahal, which is uh, congregation. And then there's also synagogue, which was a gathering. So that idea of the gathering of believers was already in existence. Uh, the Greek word kahal is actually used in the Septuagint, uh, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, so the idea of believers gathering together existed already. Uh, we also see in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the word ecclesia, that word was used to refer to uh, the community of God's people. So this word was being used uh, in uh, among people. It was also being used in Greek culture. So when there was an assembly uh, of people, so citizens were coming together in the city, that assembly was also being called Ecclesia. So it's not that this word was used for the first time only after uh, believers started worshiping Jesus and came together that they started using the word church. Uh, we are looking at historically this word was already being used in other places. So it is very possible that Jesus used the word ecclesia in math, like how it's recorded in Matthew 16, 18 and Matthew 18, 17. Okay, sister. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we've come to the end of class for today. Um, I'll see you on Thursday. Um, I actually will be traveling this week. Um, so Thursday, uh, I'll take the class online. I won't be here in person, uh, but I'll take the class online. So we'll get that set up for all of you who are joining in person. Okay. Thank you. OK, sorry, Sanjay, you have a question? Uh, no, Pastor. I just wanted to share a, a thought, a short thought. Like, uh, So there's this person called Jay Warner Wallace, who is a highly respected homicide detective and forest, forensic expert. So when he studied the Synoptic Gospels uh, and investigated the claims of the New Testament, he actually became a believer. In fact, he wrote a, a very popular book called Cold Case Christianity. And uh, so uh, it only goes to show that God willfully you know, had the synoptic gospels in the bible for a reason and so when this gentleman who was a highly respected detective and forensic expert studied the gospels from uh for, from the lens of a detective and mm. forensic expert he became a believer so it only goes to show that you know god doesn't uh, uh, allow or cause things for no reason yes i'll just probably share a link to this at the bottom thank sure, you sure, Pastor. Sure. thank you so much you can share it on Google Classroom. Yes, I think. I'll do that. I'll do, I'll do that. that. Thank, you. Be, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, have a good week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you sister. Bye-bye. Thank you.